inviting me <coughs> here to deliver the Feynman lecture. You have honored my son, Daniel, and by honoring him, you actually am honoring American education because this is where Danny absorbed his uh, curiosity, his humanity, and his principles. And uh, I am privileged to come here and play tribute to American educators. And I recognize in the hard work and the labor you are doing in shaping the minds and the hearts of young Americans. And I'm happy to be here and address some of the students I see here because you, American students, incarnate the principles and values that guided Danny's journey. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> six years ago, almost to the day, in the midst of the great madness, in a desolate dungeon in Karachi, Pakistan, there was a young man who looked at the eyes of his captors and said, where is the guy I'm supposed to interview? Are you out of your mind? I am a journalist. And this young man was my son, Danny, a walking sunshine of humor, music, truth, and humanity, an emissary of friendship and goodwill. Yes, he was a journalist. A journalist who unveiled to millions of readers in the West the human face behind the news. A bridge builder who gave voice to millions of uh, voiceless Muslims in the Middle East, from Tehran to Yemen, from Sudan to Pakistan. He was a storyteller that told us fascinating stories about ethnic Albanians trying to make up with Serbians in Kosovo, about uh, carpet weavers in Tehran trying to weave the greatest uh, carpet in the world, about pearl divers in Bahrain, about Yemenites and Ethiopians quibbling on who owns the real Queen of Sheba, about angry young men on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro, Kilimanjaro digging in Tanzanite and uh, supporting Al-Qaeda. And as he stood there, <coughs> demanding sanity in the face of madness, that dungeon in Karachi turned into a microcosm of the 21st century and came to amplify and personify this age-old struggle between humanity and barbarity. And the struggle lasted for about a week. A week later, in the same dungeon, that young man was facing his captors, looking straight into their eyes and proclaimed his identity. My name is Daniel Pearl, he said. I am a Jewish American journalist from Encino, California. My father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, and I am Jewish. He did not say it under coercion. He did not say it in defiance or gallantry. He said it in his usual matter-of-factish way, slightly irritated, as if saying, how many times do I have to repeat myself? Two plus two makes four, and I am Jewish. He was not so naive as to ignore the venom that drew down his captor's face each time he uttered the word Jewish, but he still repeated, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, and I am Jewish. What did he mean by those 11 words? Well, Danny was not religious in the conventional sense. Judaism for him was a language of his extended family a source of strength, commitment, and historical identity. When Daddy said, I'm Jewish, what he told his captor was, I respect Islam precisely because I'm Jewish, and I expect you to respect me and my faith precisely because you are or you claim to be good Muslims. 
In other words, I come from a place where one's heritage is the source of one's strength. And one's strength is measured by one's capacity to accommodate diversity because it is only through diversity that we can recognize our common humanity. I'm Jewish means I must understand. In other words, I am possessed with that historically baked obsession to understand the root of things and to understand them my way because my wandering ancestors, hardened by a century of persecution and repression, have taught me to mistrust all dogmas and ideologies and to question every authority and every conventional wisdom. So as a Jew, I am left with no other mental tranquilizer except this chronic age to question and to understand. I understand suffering because the suffering of my ancestor is etched into my consciousness. And I understand justice because I was distilled in injustice. And I understand Muslim sufferings too because I've seen your people in Kosovo and I've worked with your carpet weavers in Tehran and I've sung with your pearl divers in Qatar. I'm Jewish means I am reminding you of the challenge of understanding others. So let's come to our senses. I'm Jewish, that what I assume he meant. I'm Jewish means I proclaim my right to be different. And I remind you, as did my ancestors for three millennia, of the shining dignity of being different. I'm Jewish means I am the litmus test of your faith and the fire test of your strength. So let's come to our senses. His next sentence, the last one that he spoke freely, shed additional light of what he meant by those words. <coughs> it goes back in the town of Nebrak in Israel. There is a street named after my great grandfather, Heim Perl who was one of the founders of the town. Now why is he telling us a strange story about his great-grandfather in Bnei Brak, in that frantic race for nanoseconds? Why does his mind stumble on this anecdotal, almost forgotten story from our family archive? As you can imagine, I have asked myself this question millions of times in the past seven years, and I would like to share my theory. He chose the story because it carries three different messages simultaneously to three different audiences. First, to his family. Second, to his captors. And third, to all of us here in the free world. To his family, he says, Behold, I'm volunteering information that no one else knows. Why? because I want you to assure you that I'm well, that I'm speaking freely, that I'm choosing my own words, that means I'm undefeated. To his captors, he says, look guys, I come from a place where a person is judged by the towns that he built, by the trees that he plants, by the wells that he digs, not by the death and destruction that he brings to the world. So let's come to our senses. At times I think that he has an even deeper meaning with that story of his grandfather in Bnei Brak. And it goes like that. You know what? In the Europe of 1924, my great-grandfather was angry too. As a matter of fact, he had as many grievances as you have today in Pakistan. Yet when he was hit on the head with an iron bar by a Polish peasant and called a dirty Jew, he did not strap himself with explosive and go uh, blow up a church. Instead, he wiped his blood and crawled home and told his wife and four children, Royze, start packing. We are going home. And he sold all his possessions and teamed with 26 other families and they bought a piece of 
arid land, <coughs> seven and a half mile northeast of Jaffa, in a place called Ibn Ibrak. That was an Arabic name for what it, the newspaper Haaretz uh, described as few uh, mud huts and a few scattered trees. And the reason they did that is they knew what they are buying. They are buying the location of the ancient town of Nebrak, which used to be a place of learning. That's a place where Rabbi Akiva established his uh, yeshiva at that time. It was a place of learning. We mentioned it in Passover in the Haggadah. That's a place where the scholars gathered to tell the story of the Exodus until the disciples told them um, the dawn is here, namely the Romans are coming, stop. And they did it because they were born there. We, children of Nebrak, I was one of them, we had no doubt that we were born there and the whole diaspora and the long story of uh, Poland and the, the pogroms were just a nightmare. We just came home. So the message is, the message is, you, when he talks to his captors, I invite you to come to Bnei Brak and to look at this town today and to judge for yourself if such a miracle could not happen in your corner of the world. This is just my speculation, of course. Who knows what he meant by those words. And finally, to the people of the free world, I think the message is also clear. He says, you know what? Despite all the protests and all the criticism that we hear around us, and all <clears throat> we can be mighty proud of who we are. We are the town builders in this world, not our friends. With all the images of the ugly West and the ugly American and the ugly Israel that my captors and their intellectual supporters have labored to paint in the past few decades, let us not forget one simple fact. We are the town builders in this world. He was then silenced forever. His murderers tried to scheme the, to sow fear and humiliation and division among us, but remarkably, with all their technical sophistication, they made a miscalculation and the outcome turned against them. The respect that Danny earned on both sides of the East West divide, the goodness of his smile and the sound of his last words became iconic personal reminders to millions of people around the planet that the current wave of terror and hatred is aimed not at a policy or a country or organization, but against the very fabric of civilized society. And it made crystal clear that the 9-11 attack was not an isolated rage of 19 lunatics against a couple of tall buildings, nor was it a reaction to US policies, but a profound clash of two ideologies, an ideology of tantrum and cruelty on one side, and an ideology of friendship and open-mindedness on the other. And that is last words, I'm Jewish immediately assume a universal dimension and have come to symbolize the right of every individual to assert his faith, heritage, and identity. And like the diary of Anna Frank in the 1950s, these three simple words have inspired pride and determination among young people of all denominations. And they read today is a majestic poem to the freedom of the human spirit and its amazing capacity to weave together the dignity of being different with the sanctity of being one. 
I would like to read you a poem that I wrote about the, the struggle in these seven days in that dungeon of Pakistan. So please bear with me. <coughs> it's called The Lion's Den. I walked the roads to Lion's Den, south of Midnight, planet Earth, Karachi, Pakistan. Some called it shit, some nursery. I saw it in my father's holy book. The lion's den, the caption read. I touched the walls on which two eyes with thousand dreams wrote songs and fiercest battle, ancient wars for seven days went on. Never in the field of human conflict has there been a clash so total, so intense in charge and aim between two cosmic forces so compressed in space, so opposed in vision, so rooted in conviction across so close a distance before so many eyes. Never stood a son of Abel so fiercely to the face of Cain, a giver to the teeth of Cain, a curious to the blinds of self, a listener to the deafening shriek of zeal, alone. Never beam the ray of light so deeply to the core of darkness, compassion to brutality, principles to whims, reason to the impulse, mankind to Attila the Hun. Never was a saga chanted in more powerful a rhyme. My name is Daniel Pearl softly spoken from the den, softly from Karachi, Pakistan. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, so the Bible tells us, no wound was found in him because he stood his ground, because he stood our ground. People often ask us if we do not seek revenge. Yes, we do. Hatred killed our son, and hatred we will fight to the rest of our life with vengeance and tenacity. In an open letter to the people of Pakistan, published in Karachi, I made it quite clear. The loss of Dani will forever tear my heart, I wrote, but I cannot think of a greater consolation than seeing your children here in Pakistan looking at his picture one day and saying, this is the kind of man I want to be. Like him, I want to be truthful and friendly and open-minded and above all respectful of others. So this is our vision of revenge. And it is this vision that compelled my family and myself to undertake the task of channeling all the energy and goodwill that this tragedy evoked and channel it to one aim, only one aim, and this is fighting the hatred that took Daniel's life. And the Daniel Pearl Foundation was created to support that vision. Of course, we do not have resources to move armies or conquer territories, but we have the goodwill of millions of decent, <coughs> principled people around the world, Christian Jews and Muslims, Israelis and Palestinians, journalists and musicians who are determined to make a difference and help contain the tsunami of hate that has swept our planet. Permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to point to a very strange phenomenon. Dozens of celebrities and philanthropists are fighting diseases and natural disasters around the world, which is very fashionable. And Bono and Bill Gates and Madonna compete with each other on fighting AIDS and malaria in Africa, which are also a noble cause, undeniably. But I ask yourself, ask yourself, who attends to fighting the culture of terror that's threatening our way of life? Show me one celebrity that is totally devoted to fighting this tsunami of hatred that is growing like epidemic in the past decade and that threatens to warm up 
this planet much before global warming. So what are we doing about it? Our foundation brings Muslim journalists on fellowship to work in the US newsroom with the hope that they will absorb the uh, dynamics of free press and will transport with themselves in their countries of origin that dynamic and develop uh, <laughs> and teach their peers the, the benefits and bring them the benefits of free press society. And we connect thousands of high school uh, around the world uh, to collaborate on writing a student newspaper, again emphasizing objective and respectful reporting. And we conduct a worldwide council that promotes unity and humanity through music and we sponsor public dialogue. And our strength is not in resources but in a symbol. Can I have that? Uh, how do you? Yeah, but in a symbol, because a symbol has an unpre <coughs> has a tremendous power. As things stands today, the world is in dire need. Thank you, in dire need for an icon of peace. Americans feel an urgent need to change the mind and hearts of young Muslims, and there simply aren't many faces around. It has earned respect on both sides of the East-West divide at which, and which are associated with dialogue and peace-seeking. There simply aren't many faces around at which both a Muslim and a Western can point and say, here goes a man of peace, an emissary of goodwill. And symbols, ladies and gentlemen, are, can turn into powerful weapons. For example, Last uh, October, in the Daniel Pearl World Music Day, there were 1,100 concerts around the world taking place in that global initiative, all dedicated to tolerance and unity, in 59 countries, including Pakistan, including Karachi, where Dani was murdered. Remember that article I told you about that I published in Karachi in 2002, where I said that one day your children will be pointing to Daniel's face and wishing they, this is the kind of man I want to be. Well, just a few weeks ago, we were surprised to get from a town named Faisalabad, a hundred miles north of, uh, of Karachi, a bunch of photographs, I don't have them with me, showing exactly what I dreamed at that day. Of course, I was in a creative mood. I didn't anticipate it. In my lifetime, I would see young Pakistanis pointing to Dani's picture and saying, this is the kind of man I want to be. But it happened. They established what they call World Tolerance Centers. They celebrate Dani mu mu Music Day every year and they commemorate his memory in a lecture series to their children in every yard site, in every anniversary. And two days from now, that would be on the 21st of uh, February, the day that his murder came to public knowledge, they will have an inauguration of a center for um, interface understanding in Faisalabad probably the only one in Pakistan, uh, in the presence of U.S. Um, Council General from Lahore, in the presence of four Imams, two bishops, no rabbi, there aren't any Jews in Pakistan. But instead of a rabbi, they asked us to send them books about Jews and Judaism. And we did. We did help of the Board of Rabbis, we collected a hundred books on Jews and Judaism and we sent them and this will be the first Jewish 